Welcome to the second part of the lecture materials for the third workshop. In this lecture we'll be looking at the Moldy ionization source and the time of flight mass analyzer and how you can put those together to build a simple mass spectrometry system. Way back in the first lecture we looked at this systems map of the general mass spectrometer. Now we're going to start looking at the individual components in more detail. In particular, in this lecture we're going to look at the Moldy ionization source and the time of flight mass analyzer. Moldy stands for matrix assisted laser desorption ionization. Now that's a bit of a mouthful which is why it's usually always just called Moldy. And as that's where the ions are made, that's where we'll begin. In Moldy, you have a Moldy plate usually made out of metal or some conductive glass. And onto that plate you deposit a mixture of your sample dispersed in a matrix, where the chemicals in that matrix are designed to absorb light energy from a laser. You let the deposited spot dry and then you insert the plate into the mass spec for analysis. Inside the instrument a laser is fired at the dried spot and the chemicals in the matrix absorb the laser energy and explode out in a plume, taking the sample molecules with them. In the plume, some of the matrix molecules will have been ionized by the laser energy, and these can transfer a proton, in the form of a hydrogen ion, onto a small fraction of the molecules from your sample, creating ions from those. And it's these sample ions we want to analyze. It sounds like this process would be really violent and would result in the sample molecules being highly fragmented down to tiny pieces. But actually that's not what happens. Moldy is a gentle ionization source, and unlike EI, doesn't result in significant fragmentation of most molecules. So that's why we call Moldy a soft ionization source. And Moldy has another advantage over EI. In EI, the molecules have to be vaporized before they get into the ion source. But for many molecules of interest, like proteins or other biomolecules, you can't simply thermally vaporize them because the heat causes them to break down before they evaporate. I mean, imagine trying to evaporate the protein in a burger. But in Moldy, the effect of the matrix is to lift these large molecules gently into the gas phase so they can now be ionized and analyzed by mass spectrometry as whole molecules. And that's what allows us to identify them. Despite the fact that Moldy is now one of the most commonly used ionization sources in the pharmaceutical industry or in biomedical research, it was actually discovered by accident. Back in the 1980s, this guy, Michael Karras, was working in the group of Franz Hillenkamp. The experiment they were working on was to take an amino acid, dissolve it in a solvent, and deposit that on a metal target. Then they were firing a laser at that dried spot at increasing energies to see what was the minimum energy you needed in order to be able to see ions coming off the plate and they called that minimum laser energy required to generate ions for a particular amino acid the threshold irradiance. To begin with, they were just looking at individual amino acids. But it really got exciting when they tried mixing two different amino acids on the plate. So in particular, the two amino acids alanine and tryptophan. Now tryptophan had a much lower threshold irradiance than alanine, and when they put them on the plate and started increasing the laser energy, once the tryptophan ions started being formed, they also saw alanine ions, even though the laser energy was far below the threshold irradiance that would have been required to show alanine ions being formed from pure alanine. In the paper they say, the mass spectrum of a mixture of alanine and tryptophan taken at the tryptophan threshold irradiance is shown in figure 5. A strong signal of the alanine quasi-molecular ion was observed in addition to that of tryptophan. It is important to note that its desorption took place at an irradiance about a tenth of that necessary for obtaining spectra of alanine alone. They quickly realized that it was the aromatic parts of tryptophan that were allowing it to absorb the laser energy so effectively, and then as that exploded off the target, it took the other compound alanine with it. So they wondered if they could do the same trick with other molecules together with tryptophan. And in the same paper they reported that they'd successfully managed to dissolve stachyose, a tetrasaccharide, 
embedded in a tryptophan matrix in the same way. Within two years they published a follow-up paper. In this paper they were still using tryptophan as a matrix, but now they were testing other molecules as well, in particular nicotinic acid. They also demonstrated a wider range of molecules that could be successfully analysed by this new laser desorption ionisation mass spectrometry technique. These molecules included melatonin, which is a polypeptide found in bee venom, and erythromycin, the antibiotic. And then very shortly afterwards, they followed that paper up with another one, now focusing mainly on nicotinic acid as a matrix, where they demonstrated you could get mass spectra of entire proteins using this matrix-assisted method. This paper has gone on to be cited over 7,000 times, which illustrates its importance in the community. Since these early beginnings, MALDI has developed tremendously, and is now one of the two most important ionisation sources for biological and pharmaceutical mass spectrometry, used in thousands of instruments around the world. As MALDI has developed, the number of matrices has increased, until there are now hundreds of different matrices that are used for many different tasks. We know now that different matrices are better for ionising different classes of molecules, and so if you're undertaking a MALDI analysis, you need to choose the right matrix for the molecules you're trying to detect. For example, 3-hydroxypicolinic acid, or 3-HPA, has been shown to be a useful matrix for looking at oligonucleotides and DNA. Dihydroxybenzoic acid, or DHB, has been shown to be useful for oligosaccharides. Alpha-cyano-4-hydroxycinamic acid, or alpha-CHCA, has been shown to be useful for a lot of different applications, such as peptides, small proteins, fats, and many small molecules. For whole proteins, many people find cinepinic acid to be a useful matrix. And dithranol has proved an important matrix for synthetic polymers. If you find yourself working on a MALDI project, one of the first tasks you may have to undertake is to optimise the matrix for your application. Because the examples I've given here are only intended to be a quick overview, they're just suggestions as a good starting point. If you search through the literature, you'll find many different matrices being used for a myriad of different applications. And indeed, it's not uncommon to find people using combinations of more than one matrix in order to get the best results for their sample. If I was starting a MALDI project, there's two strategies I might use. Firstly, I might look to see if one of the standard matrices, like the examples I've given here, will work well in the application. But I'd also do a thorough literature review to find out if someone else has done a similar analysis in the past and what sorts of matrices they found have worked well in that application. There isn't one single method of making up a MALDI sample. So what I'm describing here is just a general method that you would have to go on and further optimise. In MALDI generally, you get the best results if you co-crystallise the matrix and the sample together onto the sample plate. So you need a mixed solution containing both. And you tend to want far more matrix than analyte, something of the order of 500 to 5000 to 1 moles of matrix to moles of analyte. So you might start with a sample solution of the order of 0.1 mg per mil, and you'd make up a matrix solution around 10 mg per mil, making sure in both cases that the solvents are appropriate. And then you'd mix together 5 to 50 microliters of the matrix with 1 microliter of the sample solution to make the final solution that you'd spot onto the MALDI plate for analysis. Once you have your solution made, you then spot it onto the MALDI target which commonly has small circles on it to show you where to put the spots. So using a small pipette, you'd put half to two microliters onto the plate, and then you'd leave the solvent to evaporate. You'll get better results if you have a large number of small crystals than a small number of large crystals in MALDI. So you tend to aim for fast evaporation. But you'll find in practice the number and size of crystals will be affected by both the solvent composition, the temperature of evaporation, and what the substrate is made of. So again, it's not unusual for there to be a fair amount of optimization in working out this stage. Changing the matrix chemistry will also have a big impact on the crystallization process.
So if you change the matrix, you often have to re-optimize the spotting procedure as well. In MALDI, most of the ions end up being singly charged. Also, remember MALDI is a soft ionization source, so it doesn't induce much fragmentation during the ionization process, and you often see ions deriving from the complete molecules being ionized. In electron ionization, molecules were ionized by having one electron removed from them, leaving them with a residual positive charge. But in MALDI ionization, ions tend to be ionized by adduction. The most common form of adduct ions you see in MALDI are protonated ions. These ions contain the complete neutral molecule, but with the addition of a single free hydrogen ion which is attracted to some negative dipole on the molecular structure. If there's a source of metal ions in your sample, then you can also often see sodium and potassium adduct ions. The ionic mass of all of these ions will correspond to the mass of the neutral molecule plus the mass of the adduct ion. So if we take cocaine as an example, cocaine has a molecular weight of 303 daltons, but it will appear in a MALDI spectrum at 304 daltons because of the additional mass of the adducted hydrogen ion. It's important to remember that not all ions in a MALDI spectrum may be adduct ions. This fragment ion of cocaine seen in the same spectrum is not a hydrogen adduct ion. In this case, following the loss of the benzoic acid moiety, this molecule is left with a charge residing on the carbon. So in MALDI, ions deriving from the complete molecule will likely be adduct ions, but fragment ions can have other classes as well. MALDI can also be run in negative mode. Negative mode MALDI ions tend to be deprotonated ions, so that's the complete molecule minus a hydrogen ion. These lipid A ions all show as deprotonated negative ions because they can easily lose one of the acid hydrogens of these phosphate groups. There is one very special use of MALDI called MALDI mass spectrometry imaging. And it's worth going through this very quickly now so you can understand something important about the MALDI lasers later. One of the key questions that must be answered in the development of any new drug is where does it go in the body and can you find it in the tissue that's affected by the disease you're trying to treat? One way this is investigated is to give the prototype drug to animals and then to identify where in the animal that drug has gone. The example I'm showing on the screen is a thin section through the brain tissue of an animal that's been given such a drug. If we coat the surface of this section with a MALDI matrix and then fire a laser at it, say here, we can generate a mass spectrum of that point. And then if we fire the laser on a different point, we can get the mass spectrum from there. To generate a MALDI image, we repeat this process regularly across the whole tissue, like this. So the laser would be fired, and a mass spectrum would be collected, at each one of these points. If you take a photo with your phone, each pixel in that image has three bits of information. The intensity of the red, green, and blue light at that point. In a MALDI image, each pixel has far more than just three bits of information. It has one bit of information for every mass in the spectrum, so potentially many, many thousands. And then we can go back through this data set and say, well, what would the image look like if we were only interested in the intensity of a particular mass, say the mass of a drug or its major metabolite? And so we can build up lots of different images, all from the same tissue, showing us the distribution of different materials in that tissue. So once you've collected a MALDI mass spec image of a tissue section like this, you can go back through that data and ask it questions. Where was the drug? How much was there? Where were the metabolites? How much of them were there? Were there bacteria in this section? Is there evidence of a disease like cancer or Alzheimer's? So that makes mass spec imaging a very, very advanced tool, which is extremely powerful in an expert hands.
we don't have time in this course to go into mass spectrometry imaging in any more detail than this, which is a shame because it's a fascinating area and is becoming increasingly important in pharmaceutical development. Of course, you can't have MALDI without a laser, so it's important we look at what the MALDI lasers are in use as well. There are two major classes, the gas lasers and the solid state lasers. The gas lasers used to be by far the most common type. These are nitrogen lasers, which produce a laser wavelength of 337 nanometers. But over time, the solid state lasers have become much more common. These have a variety of different wavelengths, but they're all approximately 350 nanometers, again in the ultraviolet range. The energy per pulse in these lasers is quite high, so you must never ever look at a MALDI laser firing and never try to defeat the interlocks on an instrument until you're trained to do so. The different classes of MALDI laser each have their own strengths and weaknesses. The nitrogen lasers tend to be on older or cheaper systems because they're cheap. But they have a shorter lifetime in that they can only fire a restricted number of laser shots within the lifespan of the laser. They also have a low repetition rate, they can only fire 1 to 60 laser shots per second, and they have a reasonable variability in the intensity of that laser shot fired. And these last three points are problematic when collecting mass spectrometry images, where a single image may have many tens or hundreds of thousands of pixels on it. So with a nitrogen laser you can very quickly run through the full lifetime of that laser on just a few images. Also, because the images contain thousands of pixels, each one requiring a different laser shot, if you can only fire 1 to 60 laser shots per second, it may take hundreds of hours to get through a single image. And if the laser pulse intensity was varying while that image was collected, you won't be able to get reliable quantitative information about the amount of a drug or metabolite that was present in different regions of the tissue. On the other hand, the solid state lasers work out as more expensive to buy, but cheaper per shot because their lifetime is longer. They also offer very high repetition rates, so you can collect thousands of mass spectra per second. The laser power is very stable, which means you can get good quantification across a whole tissue section. So as a quick recap, in order to collect a MALDI spectrum, you'll need a sample solution and a matrix solution. You'll mix these together and spot them onto your MALDI target plate. Then you'll let them dry and crystallize together. Then you insert the plate into the mass spectrometer and fire the laser at the spot. This will desorb a plume and from that plume you'll make sample ions and then you collect the mass spectrum of those sample ions. If you're making a MALDI image you do a similar process only this time you'll start with a tissue section and then spray coat that with your matrix solution before inserting it into the mass spectrometer. Then you'll fire a laser at one point, collect a mass spectrum there, move the laser to the next point, collect a mass spectrum there, and so on until you've covered the whole tissue. But the MALDI part of this instrument really only governs how the ions are made. Now we need to go on and look at how they're analysed to produce mass spectra. If you cast your mind back to the first lecture, we looked at this slide, where we were wondering how a particle would move in an electric field. So here we have a positively charged ion between two plates, where this plate's at plus 5 kilovolts and this plate's at ground. And the ion will feel a force driving it towards the ground plate. In this simple setup, the electrical potential will go from 5 kilovolts at the high voltage plate to zero at the ground plate. And because the ion starts exactly in the middle, it starts with a relative potential of 2.5 kV. As the ion accelerates towards the ground plate, it converts potential energy to kinetic energy. And if we assume that the ion was singly charged, that means it will have gained 2.5 kiloelectron volts of kinetic energy as it arrives at the plate. If we now replace the ground plate with a grid, the ion won't collide with it, it'll pass straight through and continue out into space. And if no other forces act on it, it will continue moving with this kinetic energy indefinitely. So having reminded ourselves about ions being accelerated in electric fields, now let's go on to look at time-of-flight mass analyzers.
Generating a mass spectrum of ions using a time of flight mass analyzer is a bit like holding a race. The analyzer itself is the racetrack, and we're going to start all the ions at the same time and measure how long it takes them to reach the finish. In a time of flight mass analyzer, the light ions will finish first and the heavy ions will finish afterwards, and the length of time an ion has taken to fly down the length of the track is proportional to its mass. So this is the basic layout of a time of flight mass analyzer. Over here we have the time of flight source, and it comprises a repeller plate and a grid, which are a lot like the example we saw a couple of minutes ago. The flight tube, or the field free region, that's the racetrack, and the detector goes at the far end. To show you how it works, let's generate two ions in the middle of the TOF source, one light and one heavy. Then we'll apply voltages to the repeller plate and the drawout grid to fire those ions through the drawout grid across the field free region and into the detector. As we saw earlier, the kinetic energy gained by an ion as it moves down an electrical potential gradient depends only on its starting potential and the charge on the ion. So if both of these ions start off with a single charge, they'll both end up with exactly the same kinetic energy as they pass through the drawout grid. If you remember back to your school level physics, kinetic energy equals half the mass times the square of the velocity. And if both of these ions have the same kinetic energy, that means the lighter one must be travelling faster than the heavier one. So if we put a detector at the end of the field-free region, the lighter ion will arrive first, and then the heavier ion will arrive afterwards. Let's see. Let's watch that again. In three, two, one. In time of flight mass analyzers, the flight tube is an electrically field free region, which means whatever speed the ions enter at, that's the speed they'll traverse the entire flight tube at. And that means that if you have ions of two different masses in the mass spectrometer, the longer the flight tube, the longer the time difference there will be between the exit times of those two ions. And that's why when building time of flight mass analyzers, you want to go for the longest flight tube you can get. So let's look at some of the equations associated with time of flight mass spectrometry. We've already discussed how, if we let an ion accelerate in an electric field, it converts electrical potential energy to kinetic energy. In these equations, all the variables should have SI units. So the charge on the ion Z should be in coulombs, the voltage capital V should be in volts, the mass M should be in kilograms, and small v, the velocity, should be in meters per second. Because we're converting the electrical potential energy into kinetic energy, we can bring these two equations together like this. So this is telling us that as the ion reaches the drawout grid, its potential energy has been converted into kinetic energy. In mass spectrometry, as you've seen, we're always interested in the mass to charge ratio of the ions. So let's rearrange these equations to put that on one side. Make sure you could do this rearrangement if asked to. Once the ions enter the flight tube, they're allowed to fly for a set distance before they hit the detector. And we remember that distance equals speed times time. So if we rearrange this equation to solve for velocity, and then substitute it into the equation above, we get this. For all ions being detected in the same mass spectrum, they all flew down the same length of flight tube, so d is the same for all ions in the spectrum and they were all accelerated by the same voltage, so capital V is the same for all ions in the spectrum. And of course the 2 is a constant. So let's leave all these constants on one side, and pull all the other variables across to the other side of the equation. Now because the 2V upon d squared must be constant for all ions in the same spectrum, that means 
the m over z times t squared for one ion must equal m over z times t squared for another ion in the same spectrum. This equation means that if we know the mass to charge ratio and arrival time of one ion, and we know the mass to charge ratio of a second ion, we can predict its arrival time. Or alternatively, if we know the arrival time of that second ion, we can predict its mass to charge ratio. One other thing to note about this equation is that it's no longer necessary to use SI units. For all the equations we've used to derive this equation, yes, SI units were essential there to get the correct answer. But in this equation, we have two sides which are both mathematically identical. And that means that so long as we keep the units constant from one side to the other, the equation is still accurate, irrespective of what units we use. So that means we can now use Daltons for m, integer charge units for z, and we'll keep seconds or microseconds or milliseconds, whatever, for time, so long as it's constant on both sides of the equation. So let's look at some problems to see how we could use this equation for real. In the figure is an uncalibrated time of flight mass spectrum of an unknown compound. And I've labelled the flight times of two of the ions in the spectrum. Given the information about ionic masses, is this likely to be a spectrum of codeine or cocaine? In the earlier examples, I always showed the ions being created exactly in the middle of the time of flight source. That is, their position being equidistant between the repeller and the drawout grid. But of course, in reality, the ion cloud would spread out within this source region. So some of the ions would end up being closer to the drawout grid, and some of the ions would end up being closer to the repeller. The voltage experienced by ions in a time of flight source isn't constant across the source. It's high near the repeller and low at the drawout grid. And this means that ions that begin near the repeller start at a higher relative potential than those that start near the drawout grid. And this has a very important effect on how the ion cloud will move through the instrument. This is because, in a time of flight source, the initial potential of the ion is converted into kinetic energy. So for these three ions, if they all have the same mass to charge, the red ion will start at the highest potential and so will pick up the most kinetic energy and end up being the fastest. The green ion will pick up the least kinetic energy and so will end up being the slowest and the blue ion will be somewhere in the middle. So watch what happens if I now turn on the accelerating potentials in this source. The faster ions catch, then overtake their slower peers. So for ions of the same mass, the highest energy fastest ions will reach the detector some time before the slower ions, meaning much fatter peaks than we would like. And that gives rise to a problem. In a time of flight mass analyzer, we want to have as long a flight tube as possible, because long flight tubes mean that there's a bigger time difference between the arrival times of ions of similar masses. However, this energy problem means that the longer the flight tube, the wider the peaks are, so the more difficult it is going to be for us to distinguish peaks of similar mass. So we need to find some way of correcting for this energy spread so that we can have long flight times but without the ion packets getting spread out in time. The solution to this problem is something called a reflectron, otherwise known as an ion mirror. Here we can see two ions of the same mass starting in different positions in an ion source. The red ion starts at a higher potential, so we'll end up picking up more kinetic energy and end up being faster than the green ion. So although the red ion starts further from the detector, it will catch the green ion at the primary temporal focus and will then overtake it, and the distance between the ions will continue to increase the longer the flight tube is. The primary temporal focus, or primary focus, in a time of flight mass spectrometer is the place where the ion packets have the best focus in time. That is, where the faster ions exactly catch up with the slower ions so that they all have the same arrival time, at least for ions of the same mass. If you could put a detector at the primary focus, then you'd get very good spectral resolution, 
because all the ions of the same mass would arrive at the same time. However, the flight time to the primary focus is often very short, and that may mean it's still impossible to tell apart ions of similar but different mass. If you put your detector after the primary focus, then the ion packets are starting to diverge again, so the resolution gets lower and lower the longer the flight time is. To counteract this divergence, we'll put a reflectron into the ion path. A reflectron provides a potential gradient that goes against the direction that the ions are moving in. As ions ride up this potential gradient, they lose kinetic energy, and therefore speed, until they eventually turn around and go back the other way. The faster an ion enters the reflectron, the further it has to penetrate into it before it turns around and comes back again. If you carefully design the potential gradient within a reflectron, you can overcome the energy spread caused by the behaviour of the ion cloud in the ion source. And that creates a second temporal focus after the reflectron, where again all the ions of the same mass will arrive at that point at the same time. And that's where you put a detector in a reflectron instrument. So adding a reflectron into a time-of-flight system allows us to have a very long flight path without the energy spread of the ions resulting in poor resolution. A reflectron is usually built out of a series of electrodes that are circular or letterbox shaped and where there is a chain of resistors between the rings in order to define the potential gradient. In this image you can see the chain of resistors linking every electrode down this left hand edge. In the orientation shown in this image an ion would enter from the top, get reflected by the potential gradient and exit back out the top again. The reflectron concept was actually developed by some Soviet scientists in the early 1970s. And the inclusion of reflectrons onto time-of-flight mass spectrometers made an order of magnitude increase in the resolution. More recently, several groups have started looking at time-of-flight mass spectrometer designs that incorporate two reflectrons in opposition to each other and where the ion packet passes between them many, many times. This design of instrument allows you to both compensate for the energy spread in the ion packet and fold an incredibly long ion flight path into a relatively compact instrument. It seems likely that the next generation of time of flight systems will incorporate this kind of design. And these may offer resolving powers in excess of 100 or 200,000. This range of performance has previously only been achievable in the highest end Fourier transform class mass spectrometers. Whatever design of time-of-flight mass spectrometer you use, they always operate on the concept of a race. So the ions all need to have a very defined start time in order that you can measure their flight time accurately. There are two main ways you can achieve this. You can have the voltages in the ion source on all the time, but have very sharply defined pulsed ionisation, like from the laser pulse in a Maldi. Or, you can have the voltages off in the ion source, but the ions being created continuously, and then suddenly turn the voltages on very, very quickly and then off again in order to give a single ion packet being accelerated into the time of flight. Later in the course, we'll look at an ion source called electrospray, which produces a continual beam of ions. Pulsed extraction is needed to couple a time of flight mass analyzer to an electrospray type ion source in order that you get a very tightly defined ion packet getting accelerated into the time of flight analyzer. In MALDI systems though, you already have a highly pulsed ion source. The ions are only created when the laser's fired. But within the desorbed plume, there's a huge range of ion energies, and this will affect the resolving power of the instrument. So MALDI instruments actually usually keep the voltages in the ion source off when the laser's fired. They then let the plume expand for a period of time, and as it expands it cools, and that reduces the energy spread of the ions. Only after this delay period do they turn the voltages on in the ion source and extract the ions from mass analysis. And this delayed extraction strategy improves the mass resolving power of the instruments. So now we've looked at both the MALDI ionization source and a time of flight mass analyzer, we can put them together to build a complete mass spectrometer. I'll let the animation run through once, 
and then we'll go back through it again step by step. So let's look at all the details in this animation. At the back here we have the moldy plate, which in this case is also acting as the repeller. So on top of this plate we'll deposit our sample, co-crystallized with our moldy matrix. To make some ions, we'll fire the moldy laser at the sample spot. Iron molecule reactions inside the plume ionize some of the sample molecules. And as the plume expands, the energies in the plume rapidly cool, so the system allows this to happen as it will improve the spectral resolution. For the purposes of this animation, let's imagine we've made two kinds of ions. A heavier ion, shown as the large green circle, and a lighter ion, shown as the small red circle. After the reflectron, you can see I've added some beam steering optics. These are needed on most instruments in order to accurately direct the ion packets onto the detector. Indeed, in some instruments, if we fired the ions straight into the reflectron, they'd come straight back out again. So now, having let the plume expand and cool, we can turn on the voltages in the ion source to accelerate the ions down the time of flight. Now watch how the lighter ions reach the detector before the heavier ion. And let's watch that again. This time focus on the two smaller red ions. You'll notice that at the time of the extraction pulse, one of them is much closer to the drawout grid than the other. So the further forward ion will end up with less kinetic energy being added, and so will travel a shorter path through the refractron to the detector than the faster ion, and you can see these different flight paths in the animation. But you can also see that travelling the longer path means that the faster ion ends up arriving at the detector at the same time as the slower ion. So in this case the reflectron has done exactly what it needed to do and corrected for the energy spread coming from the ion source, and the detector has been correctly placed at the second temporal focus. Let's just watch it one more time. I expect that a lot of you have noticed that there's another detector in this diagram, this so-called linear detector behind the reflectron. In linear mode, the voltages in the reflectron are turned off, so the ion packet can go straight through to the linear detector. And why might you want to do this? Well, if you look at the linear mode mass spectrum shown here, you can see the key benefit. The peaks are higher. In fact, on some time-of-flight instruments, for example those from waters, the linear mode is actually known as sensitivity mode. But because the flight path is shorter and there's no reflectron to correct for the energy spread, the resolution in linear mode is lower. And there's still one more benefit to using a time-of-flight instrument in linear mode, and that is that the mass range that you can detect is often higher. So if you're looking for very large mass ions, so complete proteins or large polymers, it may be necessary to run in linear mode rather than reflectron mode. When ions arrive at the end of the time of flight tube, we have to have some way of detecting them. It is possible in some instruments to measure the ion current directly. Remember, ions carry a charge, so if you let the ion beam strike a metal surface and then connect a wire from that surface to ground, you can measure the current in that wire. But in most mass spectrometers used for pharmaceutical or medical research, the ion beams simply don't have enough ions in them in order to measure the current reliably in this way. They just wouldn't be sensitive enough. So time-of-flight mass spectrometers use a kind of detector called a multi-channel plate, which offers an enormous amplification of the ion beam signal.
I've added these links at the bottom to take you to articles where you can find out more information about how MCPs work. MCP detectors are made out of thin sheets of resistive glass, through which there are thousands of tiny circular holes. These are the channels. Because the glass is resistive, if we put electrical connections on either side of the glass, whatever voltages we apply there, there is a smooth voltage gradient along the edge of each of the channels through the plate. When used as detectors, for example in a time-of-flight mass spectrometer, the front face of the MCP has to be set to a potential that's highly attractive to the ions being detected. So for positive mode ions, we set the front face of the MCP to a highly negative potential. The other side of an MCP is always set to a potential that is more positive than the front face. If an incoming ion hits the inside of one of these channels with enough energy, it can cause it to emit secondary electrons. When these secondary electrons themselves hit the side of a channel, each one of them can produce another secondary electron shower, and every collision between these electrons on the side panel produces more and more electrons. By the time this electron cascade exits the other side of the plate, the signal has been amplified many thousands, possibly even a million times. The electron cascade is captured on a metal plate, and then that discharges to ground through a fast digitizer. In the previous slide, the channels through the MCP were shown as passing directly from one side to the other. If MCPs were actually constructed like this, there would be a risk that ions could pass straight through the channels without colliding with a wall on the way. So in practice, MCPs are designed so that the channels pass through them at an angle, something of the order of 8 degrees. And in real MCP detection systems, two MCP plates are used. The channels in one plate are angled in one direction, and in the other plate in the opposite direction, and this is to maximise the chance of both ions and electrons impacting on the walls as they pass through the plates. Because of the pattern produced by the channels, this is known as the chevron design. Again, you can follow these links to get more information. The signal produced by an MCP detector is proportional to the potential difference between the front and back plates. So you can increase the signal by increasing the voltage, and that means more sensitivity. However, MCPs have a limited life, and over time you will have to use higher and higher voltages just to get the same amplification you saw in their early life. So increasing the voltage too early limits the lifespan and means you'll have to buy another detector. One other thing to note is that MCPs don't like moisture or dirt. So this means they need to be stored carefully, usually in a can under vacuum or dry atmosphere, and if you ever have to handle them, don't get fingerprints on them, always use gloves. We're going to look at a variety of different mass analyzers in this course, and it's important that you're able to contrast their capabilities effectively. So for each mass analyzer, we'll look at the same parameters in order that they're easy to compare. So we'll start with pressure. In a time-of-flight mass spectrometer, we need the ion to travel 1 to 2 metres through a vacuum before it's detected, and that's quite a long way. And we don't want it to have collisions with background gas molecules on the way, in case they change its speed and therefore its arrival time, or cause it to pick up energy and fragment. So consequently, you need quite a good vacuum in a time-of-flight system, something of the order of 10 to the minus 6 millibars or better. The flight time of ions down a time-of-flight tube is of the order of microseconds, so it really doesn't take very long to record a complete mass spectrum. Because of this, time-of-flight instruments can record complete mass spectra thousands of times per second. Although because the number of ions involved in each spectrum is low, they will commonly average several spectra together to produce a single one to display. Regarding resolving power, the current generations of time-of-flight instruments offer pretty good resolving power, so around 5,000 for a small, simple linear time-of-flight system, up to over 50,000 for the top-end reflectron systems. And the next generation systems may offer double to five times that, so 100,000 to 250,000 resolving power. In order to get good mass accuracy in time-of-flight mass spectra, you need to be able to measure the flight time of ions very accurately. Consequently, the companies who build time-of-flight mass analyzers 
invest in developing low jitter electronics that avoid small errors in the timing of different spectra, and they build the instruments out of materials that have a low coefficient of heat expansion, because otherwise, as the lab temperature changed during the day, the length of the flight tube would vary, and this change in length would be detectable in the flight times of the ions. We'll cover tandem mass spectrometry later in the course. But briefly, tandem mass spectrometry is where you select a parent ion, you deliberately fragment that, and then you collect a mass spectrum of the product ions. And you can't do that on a single time of flight instrument. So we'd say that basic time of flight instrument is not capable of tandem mass spectrometry. But TOF mass spectrometers do offer very good sensitivity because of the highly multiplying NCP detectors that they use. And compared to other mass spectrometers, the price of a simple Moldy-TOF instrument is going to be at the low to medium end. Complexity-wise, they're also quite simple. The most complex thing in a time-of-flight instrument is the very fast electronics that are needed to digitize the signal as the ions arrive at the detector. And when it comes to the mass range, theoretically, a time-of-flight instrument has an unlimited mass range. This is because all ions that experience the fields in the time-of-flight source will be accelerated down the flight tube. However, in practice, the sensitivity for very high masses tends to be low, in part because of the way the detectors work. But despite this, time-of-flight instruments offer the widest mass range of any of the commercially available mass spectrometers. In fact, the masses of entire virus particles have even been detected using time-of-flight instruments. So to recap, in this session we've looked at moldy ionization and time-of-flight mass analysis. I've also made an HTML5 version of this video. The benefit of watching the presentation in HTML5 mode is that you get to go through it at your own pace and answer questions and problems as you go along to help you understand the material. To find the HTML5 versions, go to the Kilgour Lab website at www.kilgourlab.com and then go to the teaching resources page. On there you'll find a whole variety of resources to help you learn about mass spectrometry. I hope you enjoy them. And so that brings us to the end of this preparation material for the third workshop.